गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला द नेम ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल इज द शेड्यूल ट्राइब्स एंड अदर ट्रेडिशनल फॉरेस्ट ट्वेलर्स रिकग्निशन ऑफ फॉरेस्ट राइट्स एक्ट टू थाउजेंड सिक्स आफ्टर स्टडिंग दिस मॉड्यूल यू विल बी एबल टू नो द ऑब्जेक्टिव विद विच दिस एक्ट वॉज पास द पर्सन्स हु कैन क्लेम दीज राइट्स द list of the rights which are termed as forest rights and the procedure which has been engrafted under the act to recognize and vest these rights in order to understand the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers act let us first understand the historical background which led to the passage of this act many tribal people and other forest communities have depended on forest for generations forests are the source of their livelihood customs traditions and identity however the issue of community access and rights over natural forests and resources have always been contentious before independence forests were viewed as crown lands and extensive tract of forest were declared as reserved forest this declaration process led to the extinguishment of the traditional rights of forest dwelling communities tribal as well as non tribal after independence the second phase of extension of government control over the forests began this started with the setting up of a network of protected areas which further eroded rights of these forest dwelling communities in fact the modern conservation approaches always advocated their exclusion rather than their integration in the absence of clearly defined property rights millions of forest dwelling families living in and around forest have been perceived as encroachers or illegal occupants in addition to this the simplicity of the tribal people and their ignorance of modern regulatory framework precluded them from asserting their genuine claims to resources in areas where they belong to insecurity of tenure and fear from eviction the two factors insecurity of tenure and fear from eviction from the land where these people had thrived for generations was perhaps the biggest factor why tribal community in india felt emotionally as well as physically alienated from forest and forest land so we see that a lot of historical injustice was done to these forest dwelling communities in order to undo this historical injustice the government of india in the year 2006 enacted the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act this act was enacted by the parliament in the winter session of 2006 and it came into effect from 31st december 2007 the act is supplemented by the rules framed under it known as scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights rules and in addition to it guidelines are framed by the central government this act is commonly known as forest rights act it is applicable to the whole of india except the state of jammu and kashmir now let us understand the objectives of this act the act has four objectives firstly it recognizes the forest rights of the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers secondly it vests the forest rights in forest land to these forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers thirdly it provides a framework 
for recording these forest rights vested in these forest dwelling communities and fourthly it tells us about the nature of evidence required for the recognition and vesting of foreign rights. Now let us have an overview of the entire act. The whole act is divided into six chapters and contains 14 sections in total. Chapter 1 contains two sections and is named as preliminary chapter. In section 1, it talks about the title of the act, the territorial applicability of the act and the date from which the act shall commence. Chap section 2 enlists some of the important definitions which are able to make us understand the act. Next is chapter 2. Chapter 2 is titled as Forest Rights. It contains one section which enlists the different rights which are termed as forest rights. Chapter 3 is titled as Recognition, Restoration and Vesting of Forest Rights and Related Matters. Section 4 of this chapter talks about recognizing the forest rights and vesting of these rights in forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. Section 5 of the Act talks about the duties of these forest dwellers. Chapter 4 is titled as Authorities and Procedures for Vesting of Forest Rights. This chapter tells us about the different authorities which are established for vesting of forest rights and the procedure that is followed for vesting these rights. Chapter 5 is titled as Offences by Members or Officers of Authorities and Committees under the Act. Section 7 and 8 of this chapter talks about the different offences which can be committed by the members or officers of different authorities and committees and the bar of the court on taking cognizance of these offences. Chapter 6 is the last chapter and contains section 9 to 14 and it is titled as Miscellaneous Provisions. Now, let us understand what are the salient features of this act. The act is one of the most important and popular entitled, entitlement based laws ever enacted in India. It favors the tribal and other traditional forest dwellers rights over forest land. The salient features are, first, it was for the first time that the Indian government admitted that the rights of forest dwellers have not been adequately recognized and in fact, a lot of historical just injustice has been done to them. Whereas, these forest dwellers are integral to the very survival and sustainability of the forest ecosystem. Secondly, the act recognizes the forest rights of forest dwelling scheduled tribes as well as other traditional forest dwellers. In addition to those who are dwelling in forest, the act also recognizes the forest rights of those who were displaced from their dwelling and cultivation without land compensation due to state development interventions and where the land has not been used for the purpose for which it was acquired within five years of the said acquisition. Next, the act enlists different types of rights which are known as forest rights. The aim of the act is to ensure livelihood and food security of the forest dependent communities, provide for basic developmental facilities for the forest villages, provide legal recognition to the community conservation initiatives thereby strengthening traditional conservation practices that protect some of the critical ecosystems of the country, 
protect traditional knowledge and intellectual property related to biodiversity and cultural diversity, protect customary rights of the forest communities, empower these forest communities to protect, conserve and manage forests and their biodiversity, conserve the common forest and biodiversity resources assessed by the community which are threatened by destructive activities and establish a empowered institution at the community level for the conservation and management of natural resources. The act also mandates that no forest dwelling scheduled tribe and other traditional forest dweller shall be evicted or removed from the forest land under his occupation till the recognition and verification procedure is complete. The act secures the forest rights to individuals as well as the community rights. These rights shall be conferred free from all encumbrances and procedural requirements. Next, the act also puts an obligation on these forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. The act provides a three-tier structure of authorities to vest forest rights, namely Gram Sabha, Subdivisional Level Committee and District Level Committee. In addition to these structures, it also provides for the establishment of a state level monitoring committee to monitor the process of recognition and vesting of forest rights and also to submit reports to the nodal agency. Under the act, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs under the central government has been declared as the nodal agency for the implementation of the provisions of this act. The act imposes a criminal liability on the officers and the members who contravenes the provisions of this act or the rules. The act authorizes the central government to frame rules and also to issue directions in order to carry out the provisions of this act. Lastly, the provisions of these act is in addition to and not in derogation of the provisions of any other law for the time being in force. Now, first of all, let us understand that who all can claim the rights under this act. The forest rights can be claimed by two category of people. First, by forest dwelling scheduled tribes and second, other traditional forest dwellers who have occupied the forest land before 13 December 2005 notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force. Let us see what is meant by forest dwelling scheduled tribes. Forest dwelling scheduled tribe means the members of the community of the scheduled tribe who primarily reside in and depend on forest or forest land for bona fide livelihood needs and includes the scheduled tribe pastoralist communities. Other traditional forest dweller means any member or community who has for at least three generations prior to 13th December 2005 primarily resided in and who depend on forest land for bona fide livelihood needs. The word generation here means a period comprising of 25 years. In addition to these two categories, the rights under these act are also conferred on those who live on forest land. Now the word forest land is much wider and it means land of any description falling within any forest area and includes unclassified forest, undemarcated forest, existing or deemed forest, protected forest, reserved forests, sanctuaries and national parks.
Although forest rights can be claimed by forest dwelling communities in centuries and national parks also, but as far as centuries and national parks are concerned, the rights can be modified and resettled, especially in critical wildlife habitats of these national parks and sanctuaries. First of all, let us understand what is meant by the word critical wildlife habitat. Critical wildlife habitat means such areas of national parks and sanctuaries where it has been specifically and clearly established on the basis of scientific and objective criteria that such areas are required to be kept as inviolate for the purposes of wildlife conservation. Although the rights can be modified or resettled in these critical wildlife habitats, but it is subject to certain conditions. Now these conditions are, first of all, the process of recognition and vesting of the rights in the forest should be complete in all areas. Secondly, it has been established that the activities or the impact of the presence of the right holders will cause irreversible damage and threaten the existence of wildlife species and their habitat. And no other reasonable option exists as far as these critical wildlife habitats are concerned. In addition to these three conditions, the forest rights can be modified or resettled only after a resettlement or alternate package has been prepared and communicated to the affected individuals and communities. This package should provide a secure livelihood and also fulfill other requirements, other relevant laws and policies of the central government. Free informed consent of the concerned Gram Sabha as to the proposed resettlement and to the package has to be obtained in writing. The act further ensures that no resettlement shall take place until these facilities and land allocation at the resettlement location is complete. The critical wildlife habitat from where the forest right holders have been relocated shall not be subsequently diverted for any other purpose. After understanding that who all can claim these rights, let us understand what are actually the forest rights. In order to understand the typology of forest rights, I have divided these rights into two types. First is the rights on all forest lands, which includes individual rights as well as community tenure rights or both of them. And second is the developmental rights. Now, first of all, let us see what are the forest rights as far as individual or community tenure are concerned. These rights are, first, right to hold and live in the forest land under the individual or common occupation for habitation or for self-cultivation for livelihood. However, this right shall be restricted to area under actual occupation and shall in no case exceed an area of four hectares. Next is the right of ownership, assess to collect, use and dispose of minor forest produce which has been traditionally collected within or outside village boundaries. Now minor forest produce includes all timber forest produce of plant origin including bamboo, brushwood, stumps, cane, cocoons, honey wax, lac, tendu or kendu leaves, medicinal plants and herbs, roots, tubers and the like. Next is the rights in or over disputed lands under any nomenclature in any state where claims are disputed. Rights for the conservation of patas or leases or grants issued by any local authority or any state government on forest land to title. 
Next are the community rights such as Nistar or by whatever name called. Nistar means the concession granted from removal from forest coops on payment at stipulated rates specified forest produce for bona fide use but not for barter or sale. Generally, the forest produce distributed at Nistar rates is timber poles, firewood, etc. Other community rights of uses of entitlement such as fish and other products of water bodies, grazing and traditional seasonal resource assess of nomadic or pastoralist communities. Rights including community tenures of habitat and habitation for primitive tribal groups and pre-agricultural communities. Rights of settlement and conversion of all forest villages, old habitation, unsurveyed villages and other villages in forest into revenue villages whether recorded, notified or not. Forest villages means the settlements which have been established inside the forest by the forest department of any state government for forestry operations or which were converted into forest villages through the forest reservation process. Next is the right to protect, regenerate or conserve or manage any community forest resource which they have been traditionally protecting and conserving for sustainable use. Rights which are recognized and accepted as rights of tribals under any state law, autonomous regional or district council or traditional or customary law. Right of access to biodiversity and communal right to intellectual property and traditional knowledge related to biodiversity and cultural diversity. Any other traditional right customarily enjoyed by the forest dwelling scheduled tribes or other traditional forest dwellers as the case may be, which has not been mentioned here. But please remember this excludes the traditional right of hunting or trapping or extracting a part of the body of any species of wild animal. Right to in situ rehabilitation including alternative land in cases where the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers have been illegally evicted or displaced from forest land of any description without receiving their legal entitlement of rehabilitation prior to 13th December 2005. So these rights together are known as forest rights. These rights are inheritable but not alienable or transferable. The rights shall be registered jointly in the name of both the spouses in case of married persons. And in the, case, in the name of a single head in the case of a household headed by a single person. In the absence of a direct hire, the heritable right shall pass to the next of kin. Now the second leg of forest rights is known as developmental rights. Developmental rights means the rights of forest dwelling communities over development facilities such as health and educational facilities, fair price shops, electric and telecommunication lines, tanks and other minor water bodies, drinking water supply and water pipelines, water or rainwater harvesting structures, minor irrigation canals, non-conventional sources of energy, skill upgradation or vocational training centers and roads. However, in this case, the precondition is that the development projects are to be provided by the central government only after the Gram Sabha recommends for the same. Now, these dwellers have been given the forest rights, duties of forest right holders. In addition to giving them rights, the Act also puts an obligation on forest right holders. Their obligations are, first, to protect the wildlife, forest and biodiversity. 
Second, to ensure that adjoining catchment area, water sources and other ecological sensitive areas are adequately protected. Third, to ensure that the habitat of forest dwelling schedule tribes and other traditional forest dwellers is preserved from any form of destructive practices affecting their cultural and natural heritage. And fourth, to ensure that the decisions taken in the Gram Sabha to regulate, assess to community forest resources and stop any activity which adversely affects the wild animals, forest and the biodiversity are complied with. In addition to forest right holders, these duties have also been, have also to be performed by the Gram Sabha and village level institution in areas where there are holders of forest rights. Next is the authorities established under the Act. The Act provides for a three-tier structure of authorities to vest forest rights. These authorities are firstly Gram Sabha, second subdivisional level committee and third district level division committee. Gram Sabha means a village assembly which shall consist of all adult members of a village and in case of states having no panchayats, padas, tolas and other traditional village institutions and elected village communities with full and unrestricted participation of women. In addition to Gram Sabha, we have the subdivisional level committee and the district level committee. Plus, we also have a state level monitoring committee. These three committees shall consist of officers of the Department of Revenue, Forest and Tribal Affairs of the state government and three members of the Panchayati Raj institutions of whom two shall be the scheduled tribe members and at least one shall be a woman. Now let us understand the process of vesting these rights. The Gram Sabha is the initiating authority for determining the nature and extent of individual as well as community forest rights. It shall receive and hear the claims. It shall then consolidate the claims, verify them and prepare a map delineating the area of each recommended claim in the prescribed manner. After doing this, the Gram Sabha passes a resolution on claims on forest rights after giving reasonable opportunity to the interested persons and the authorities concerned. Thereafter, this resolution is forwarded to the subdivisional level committee. The Gram Sabha shall maintain a list of claimants of forest rights in the prescribed manner. The subdivisional level committee shall examine the resolution and the maps of the Gram Sabha to ascertain the veracity of the claim and forward the same to the district level committee for the final decision. Any person aggrieved by the resolution of Gram Sabha may prefer a petition to the subdivisional level committee and any person aggrieved by the decision of subdivisional level committee may prefer a petition to the district level committee. The decision of the district level committee on the records of forest rights is final and binding. The state level monitoring committee has been appointed to monitor the process of recognition and vesting of these forest rights. Now let us see what are the different offences under the Act. The Act imposes criminal liability on the officers and members of the committee who contravenes the provisions of this Act or the rules. Such persons shall be liable to pay fine which may extend to 1000 rupees. However, the person shall not be liable if he proves that the offence was committed without his knowledge or that he had exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. However, no court shall take cognizance of any offence 
unless any forest dwelling scheduled tribe in case of a dispute relating to a resolution of a Gram Sabha or the Gram Sabha through a resolution passed against any higher authority gives a notice of not less than 60 days to the state level monitoring committee and the state level monitoring committee has not proceeded against such authority. To conclude, the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers have been depending on forests for years. However, their rights have not been recognized in the past. The 2006 legislation is a landmark legislation in order to recognize their rights and vest these rights in them. Thank you.